Welcome back to another Microsoft Azure tutorial. So now that we have a basic understanding, or at least I'm hoping a more in-depth understanding of how to access resources on Microsoft Azure, we are now going to switch gears and start the process of creating some of those resources. And we're gonna start with basically what I call the data services. Um, that's kind of a broad term and that's not like really the official term, but really the intent behind these next few series is we're gonna start creating certain resources like a SQL database, a Cosmos database, blob storage, a data factory, and possibly a few other ones. And we're gonna leverage those resources to do different types of tasks. So one obviously with a SQL server is, you know, storing, inserting, and querying data. And so that's what we're gonna start off with first. And then after that, we're probably gonna to go to Cosmos database. And then after that, we will probably be going to a data factory. So the first topic we're gonna to talk about is Azure SQL. Oh yes. So what is Azure SQL? Well, a brief overview is it's a family a, of SQL Cloud databases providing flexible options for application migration, modernization, and development. With Azure SQL, you get a consistent, unified experience across your entire SQL portfolio and a full range of deployment options from edge to cloud. So basically, Azure SQL is actually a collection of different products and services, and so some of those services are, for example, SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machine, an Azure SQL Managed Instance, and then an Azure SQL Database. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the Azure SQL Database. However, a brief overview of each, the Azure Virtual Machine with SQL Server, migrate your SQL workloads to Azure with ease while maintaining complete SQL server compatibility and operating system level access. So this is really nice if you wanna do a virtual machine and then also have a SQL server that goes along with it. We also have an Azure SQL managed instance. So this is really designed for those who want to take an existing server application and then scale it with an intelligently, or sorry, intelligent fully managed service. So this is really designed for those of us who were kind of uh, migrating potentially data from an old application to a new one. And then finally, we have an Azure SQL database. So this is what I would kind of call just like your standard SQL database. Um, so this supports basically most modern cloud applications on an intelligent, fully managed service that includes serverless compute. And so this is where things kind of get a little bit technical. And I know for some of you, this might not be important, but if you are planning to create some of these resources, it's gonna be helpful to understand things like pricing, how pricing is determined. I'm not gonna claim, I'm gonna be able to explain everything in full detail, but I'm gonna try to give you at least a high level overview of some things to take into consideration. Okay, I don't know, maybe that was a duplicate one. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is database pricing. So pricing is calculated using many different factors. And so I've listed some of those factors here, depending on what type of pricing model you choose, then that will actually determine uh, some of the costs that are associated with it. So for example, if you do uh, a DTU model versus a vCore model, you actually will have uh, certain other factors that might play into what will determine your overall cost. Now at a high level, you have uh, something called like a service tier. And so with a service tier, at least for a vCore model, basically if you choose a more, ex a basically a more expensive service tier, you get more features with it. So there's general purpose, uh, business critical and hyperscale. And so these are really designed for, you know, companies in a situation who really depend on Mac making sure that their database is consistently available and can handle large workloads. Now, in our specific example, we are gonna be sticking with the general purpose service tier, and we're gonna be using a vCore model. And so the, at least high level overview with vCore is, it's more customizable, so you can actually specify what type of hardware you want to use, storage capacity, um, things, whether you wanna do a serverless uh, instance of it or if you wanna do a provisioned 
uh, instance of it. So with V Core, it's more customizable, and so it allows you to uh, really configure more features about it. So for those who want a little bit more control over the process, V Core is probably going to be the way you want to go. Where with a DTU model, that's pre-configured, so it's you don't get a lot to switch about it. You kind of just choose your configuration and you're good to go. Uh, the next topic is compute tiers. So there's provision compute tiers and then there's serverless compute tiers. We're gonna be doing serverless, but to start with provision is basically, I'm going to take a fixed amount of compute resources for a fixed price build hourly. So this costs usually a little bit more. So this is gonna cost more because I'm basically uh, provisioning a certain amount of resources. So I'm taking those resources away and I'm giving them to somebody. So because of that, because I have to provision an entire slice, I'm going to charge you for that entire slice. And that's just kind of how it is. You're saying, I want to have that resource ready to go at any time. And then you have serverless compute, which is uh, more based on price performance. So this is if you want to go for a cheaper option and it scales as you start using more and more compute services. And there's ways where you can do things like, hey, I wanna set a budget where if it goes above this budget, it can actually uh, stop and things like that. So this is computed on, what is it? Compute use per second. So this is built on a per second basis where a provision compute tier is built on an hourly uh, basis. So very different frameworks, but for the most part, I tend to go serverless only because I only wanna be charged as I use it. With provision, I don't really get that option. It's here it is, this is what I'm taking away. And based on that, it's just kind of as it is. So this is more fixed on a uh, fixed price for build hourly. And then you have hardware. So there's different hardware you can have inside of your particular SQL database. So again, if you're gonna go with the vCore model, you actually get the capability of choosing what type of hardware is inside of it. And then depending on which service tier you use, it's also going to determine what hardware you have access to. Now, in our case with the vCore, it's gonna be more than likely Gen 4 or 5, but there are the M series, there's the FSV2 series, and a few other ones. I will explain that once we get to that slide. Uh, basically, it's just computation power. That's at least high level what you need to think about in the beginning, but uh, you use the latest and greatest, you're gonna get much better performance, but you're gonna be paying more. So you just have to take that into consideration. And then there's also a deployment model. So you can either deploy a single database or an elastic pool. So a single database represents a fully managed isolated database. So you might use this option if you have a modern cloud application and microservices that need a single reliable data source. A single database is like a contained database in the SQL Server database engine. This is what we're gonna be creating today. We're gonna to be creating a single database. You also have the capability to build, or sorry, to create something called an elastic pool. So this is a collection of single databases where a, with a shared set of resources, such as CPU or memory. Single databases can be moved into and out of an elastic pool. So with an elastic pool, you just have basically more databases, but you're going to be sharing resources. So you define a set of resources and then each one of those servers is going to be sharing or sorry, databases is going to be sharing those resources. You also have storage, so you can actually pay for more storage up front. There's actually a certain amount that's pretty much given to you for free, but you can go all the way up to, I think, like eight terabytes on some instances of it. So it, again, it really just depends what your configuration is, but you can go pretty high and then obviously, as you ask for more storage, it's going to cost you more money. Then you also have backup storage. So this is just used for a lot of times companies or just something happened to your database and you need to restore it to an earlier point in time. So with that one, again, uh, the different type of backup storage that you ask for is going to determine the price. So long term retention. This is really intended for those companies who might be like, you know, finance companies who have to keep information on hands for a certain period of time, maybe a few years or something like that. So they can use long-term retention storage in order to keep that data on hand. It's cheaper. And then you also have a point in time restore storage. So this is designed for something happened with your database, something broke or whatever, and you need to restore, restore to an earlier point of time. 
The amount of time it looks back, I think is like seven or 35 days, but it depends on the tier that you're with. And again, you know, it, it all really depends. So a lot of this stuff, as you can tell, how it's defined really depends on how you're configuring it. And that's obviously going to determine the price. OK, so I mentioned in the previous slide, there's hardware considerations. So I put a list here of the different hardware uh, or the hardware generation, I guess, that Microsoft provides. And so you can see that at the top level, that's Gen 4. So that's kind of like your based one. Then you have Gen 5, and that is broken into provision compute and then serverless compute. You have the FSV2 series, and then you have the M series. So M series is the latest and greatest. That is basically where you are getting, you know, a tremendous amount of compute power ready to go and all sorts of things like that. Um, we are not going to be paying for that because that is very expensive, just as the F series as well. We will more than likely be doing the uh, Gen 4, I think, if I remember correctly. But, you know, something to look over. I'm not going to say this is necessarily going to be at the top of everyone's mind, especially for a very small project. But, you know, it is some stuff that you need to take into consideration as you start moving into some more advanced projects. OK, and then on top of that, there is actually a bunch of different tools and packages that you can use with your SQL database. And so one is called the Azure Data Studio. I call this the Visual Studio Code, but for databases and data sources. So we will actually install that in a later video and we will connect to our SQL database using that. I really like it. It's very clean. It's very easy to use. And it's just kind of neat what you can do with it. I mean, you can do notebooks and all sorts of other things. I was really impressed. I had never heard of this product until I was actually using the SQL database from Azure. And ever since I came across it, I'm in love with it. Uh, something I am more familiar with is SQL Server Management Studio. So this is another tool that Microsoft recommends if you want to manage your SQL Server instance uh, with a, a GUI, basically, so a graphical user interface. This we've used in previous videos that were related to T-SQL. So you can also connect to your Azure SQL database using SQL Server Management Studio. There's also the SQL Server data tools. And so this is a modern development tool for building SQL Server relational databases, Azure SQL databases, analysis services, data models, integration services packages, and reporting services reports. With SSDT, you can design and develop any SQL Server content type with the same ease as you would develop an application in Visual Studio. So I don't have any videos currently planned for this, but if this is something people maybe want to go into, I'd be more than willing to. Um, I can look into it. But at this point, this is just a tool they recommend. I haven't personally used it, but it is something that's kind of sparked my interest a little bit. Additionally, you can use Visual Studio Code to connect to your SQL database. And so there's actually an extension called MSSQL. And so that's short for Microsoft uh, Microsoft SQL Server, or something like that. I think that's what the abbreviation is. I don't know off the top of my head. But with that one, it allows you to connect to your database inside of Visual Studio Code. You can write queries. You can uh, export data and stuff like that. So that's also very helpful. Personally, if I'm about to do it in Visual Studio Code, I would probably be going to Azure Data Studio unless there was something very specific. Additionally, we will be connecting to our database using Python. And so because of that, we need to make sure we have a packaged download. And so that is PyODBC. So this is a Python package that allows us to access ODB, ODBC databases. Uh, we've used this in previous videos a long time ago to connect to SQL Server, to Excel, to Access. So we're going to now just take it to the next level and connect to an Azure SQL database. Additionally, there is a package that we will be using as well. This is also used to manage our SQL Server, or sorry, SQL, well, I guess SQL Server and SQL database. That is the Azure Management SQL package. And so this allows us to manage our SQL database using Python. It's not going to necessarily allow us to uh, query and upsert data and stuff like that. This is more just for managing your SQL database. If you want to delete one, if you want to create one, if you want to change certain features or properties about your SQL database, then you're more than likely 
going to be doing it using the Azure Management SQL package unless you want to do it through either the command line interface or if you want to do it through the portal itself, so the Azure portal. And that's it for that one. Okay, so at this point, I am going to cut off the video. And then in our next video, we are going to use the Azure portal to create a new SQL database. And then after that, once we've got it all set up and everything fun and dandy, we're going to go and get some information and connect to it. So if you have any questions at this point, feel free to put them down below. Otherwise, we will see you in the next video.